So Josh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Our very first question on the top of our list is going to be, what exactly is your first memory of playing rugby? Um, well, I can remember I started in Wicklow Rugby Club um, when I was maybe five or so, but I can remember even before that in the garden with my dad uh, practicing tackling. Um, we used to always run at him. I'm pretty sure we'd get like a chocolate bar or something if we were able to, to, to drag him down, um, which never really happened. But yeah, playing in the garden with my dad or just Matt throwing around the ball inside and getting in trouble for it. Um, so something along those lines, I'd say, probably my first memory. And then and then I can remember uh, going up to Wicklow Rugby Club when I was really young and just training. Uh, I was too young to... I was with the under eights and I was five. I think my dad just dragged me along with my brother. Um, so wasn't able to, I just trained. I wasn't allowed to play matches for the first year or two. But um, so I remember that. I remember that too. That was the first organized bit of rugby anyway. Perfect. Yeah, great answer. And I think you've mentioned it there already. So obviously the age you're starting at is five years old. Was there any other sports at the time or was it just you knew you wanted to play rugby because it was in the garden with dad? Um. I think it probably all started with uh, my dad telling bedtime stories of um, of his, the tries he used to score. He loved to tell us about all the tries he scored back in the day and stuff. So um, probably started with that. Um, I would have played, I was um, myself, my brother uh, would have played a bit of everything, would have kicked football around. Yeah. Um, there was a tennis racket around. We'd pick that up and make a game out of that and uh, honestly played played a bit of anything uh, anything and everything so but definitely um, we kind of fell in love with with rugby pretty early um, my dad my dad had that had been my dad's sport and he definitely passed that on to us and, and I learned to love it as well so um, that's probably how how I ended up in uh, ended up playing rugby okay so Josh you've given us an insight into what age you started playing around grassroots level in rugby at what stage did you make the step up to provincial level? Um, I suppose in school, in um, throughout school, maybe fourth, fourth and fifth year, I got trials with the Leinster underage system. Um, didn't get anywhere with them. Kind of got one uh, one trial training session or, or so um, in each of those years. And then in sixth year, I got a trial for the Leinster under-19s. Um, managed to get through that and got picked for the summer programme with Leinster under 19s once I'd finished. Um, so that was my, I guess that was my step up from, from playing, uh, playing with the senior team in, in Wesley school I went to. Um, so I went from the senior team to playing Leinster under 19s. And then once, once you're in that system, you kind of follow the, the uh, Leinster development plan, I guess. And it kind of went, went through under 19s, under 20s, um, then got from there into the, into the Leinster Academy, got in the Irish under 19s and under 20s and kind of progressed up from there. Um, once I was in, once I was in the academy, I was, or once I'd finished school, then I was playing with UCD. Um, so played away there until, till maybe t- uh, three years or so out of school when I finally started to get training with the senior team and then um, managed to get my, my first cap then with Leinster. At what stage I suppose you're talking about being in secondary school at that age, aren't you? Yeah. At what stage did it kind of, I suppose, click like, you know what, there is actually something here for me in rugby, like a career, say. Was there a certain point in time where you knew, yeah, I really want to take this serious? Or was it a case of, I'll do the trials and I'll see what happens? What way did that play out for you? Um, I suppose I always I always uh, felt I wanted to, to play professional rugby. Um, all through school, I was, I was always one of the smallest on the team. Um, so I always thought I was uh, was a bit slow to grow. I you do I do a lot of gym work, but I never really seemed to get much bigger. Um, so I always thought maybe when I'm 26, 27, when I've uh, grown a little and done a few years of gym, I might be big enough to uh, to maybe play for Leinster someday or maybe Ireland. Um, so yes, yeah, it, it obviously it progressed a bit quicker than that, thankfully, but. Um, I think at each stage I got, so when I played Leinster in the 19s, I was like, this is amazing. I could progress from here. Yeah. But I was always, I was always, I was incredibly grateful to be there. As in, I was, that was a huge achievement for me. And if I uh, had tried my best and not achieved any more, I would have been happy with that, I guess, in a way. Um, but 
Yeah, I suppose yeah. playing playing my first Leinster game um, when I kind of got through, played 80 minutes against Zebra, um, got through that game. And once I'd done that, I, it was the first it was the first time I was like, I can, I can compete at this level or I can at least hold my own at this level. Yeah. Um, and until then, even though like, obviously you're like, yeah, I, I will be able to, I want to be a professional, that kind of thing. It's not, you always have those, um, uh, I suppose doubts or, or, or whatever about whether you'll actually be, because you never know how good you'll actually be until you actually get out there and you've played a game. Um, until then you're just training and you don't know if you'll be able for that level so I suppose it was um, that was when you when I really knew when I'd actually played a game and I was like yeah. I can play at this level but other than that it was it was quite gradual so Josh you've touched on it there around how it was a, a gradual process and you went through I suppose development camp with Leinster moved on then obviously through the ranks there what was it like to to receive your first Leinster cap what was the level of excitement like was it a massive achievement? Obviously, everyone at home would have been buzzing, but for the player themselves, like, what is it actually like to receive your first cap? Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible, really. Uh, the way the way it worked out um, was it was the week before a European Cup game, and there'd been a. I was in third year of the academy, so my it was kind of my final year. Um, so it was yes, I was hoping for to maybe get kept on at the end of that year to sign a contract with the senior team. That was kind of the goal for that year. Um, so there was, a, there was a good few injuries in the back row. Um, so I suppose in, in many ways, they didn't really have many options in terms of who they could play. Um, but there's a European game the next week. And I think uh, there was a couple of players, Sean O'Brien was one of them who was going to be back fit for for that game. But they had this this, uh, this every game before. So I managed to get the, get the nod to play seven for that game. Um, yeah, it was a, it was an incredible, an unbelievable honor because it wasn't like I was in the senior team and it was a matter of time before I got it. I was in the academy and there was plenty of people who who go through the academy and never get to play for Leinster or um, or lads in the senior team who sometimes it just doesn't work out and they don't get to play. So um, yeah, it was a it was an incredible honor. My dad uh, flew over to watch me and I, I remember. Probably one of my most special memories um, with Leinster came from that game, where obviously, as I as I said before, there was a lot of like a lot of nerves. You don't know whether you're good enough for that level. And when I finished the game, I walked over to the sideline. My dad has made his way around to the to the tunnel and gave him a big hug on the sideline. So after the game, so that was a uh, yeah, that was a pretty special moment. And yeah, brilliant moment to have. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. I'm sure it's probably something as well too. He's he's probably gonna look back on like so fondly as well, like seeing you as a, as a kid playing in the garden, like you're saying, a chocolate bar if you can take me down, and then yeah. you get to that stage as well too. It's it's a yeah. nice journey for the whole family, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, absolutely, a first Leinster cap is gonna be like you said there, something that you're gonna be so proud of. If we go on to then our next question, and, and I suppose it's it's another step up in the journey of of your player pathway, if you want to call it that. What was it like then to receive? So you've gone from your first Leinster cap. Talk us through what it was like to receive your first international cap then. Is it again, is it another heightened level of proudness, of, you know, excitement? Or, or what was that like to receive that first Irish cap? Yeah, it's, uh, it was, I suppose, a, a similar feeling. Um, but I suppose at a, definitely at a, at a higher level, I suppose, growing up in Leinster, growing up in Wicklow, always supported Leinster. That was my, my problems, my team. But then... But then I suppose the the big games to be at was when my dad would take me to the internationals at, at Lansdowne Road. Yeah. Um, that was the, I mean I suppose that's the pinnacle to pet to play, to play for your country as a little a little boy. You wanna um, everyone wants to put on a green jersey and, and represent their country. So yeah, for that reason it was it was unbelievably special. Again, it was uh, I was incredibly nervous. Um, I think any time you play. He played that level, I suppose. The whole the whole country or anyone um, interested in sport in the country is probably watching, probably watching those Irish games. And um, yeah, it's a huge amount of pressure. But I suppose the the overwhelming feel, feeling was um, absolute delight and and felt very very pr- proud. And I think it was 
uh, one of the things that made it really special was how much it meant to to my family as well and to, to get them. Good, it was over in England, the game, and a uh, good few people were fighting tooth and nail to try to get tickets and they managed to get their way yeah, out. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, incredibly, uh, incredibly special, special experience and something that I'll never forget along with my, my first Leinster one. But definitely, I suppose the Irish cap is that, it's that bit more special, I guess. Yeah, it's almost like the pinnacle, isn't it? It's like you said, like everyone at that age, when you're a young kid, like the pinnacle is that Irish jersey, isn't it? Like that's where you ultimately want to, that's what you want to achieve in the sport. Okay, Josh, so you've taken us through all of your sport and achievements, that first cap for Leinster, that first international Irish cap. On the other side of things, if it wasn't rugby, so if you weren't a rugby player, what kind of job would you have liked to have or, or what kind of career would you have liked to have followed if it wasn't rugby? Um, I suppose it, it being realistic, I'd say it was sports science was something I had really a huge interest in and, and was actually close to doing a... A sports science degree abroad um, before I got offered Leinster, the Leinster yeah. Sub Academy. So I suppose that was the realistic answer. But um, what would I want to be? Probably professional golfer, maybe professional footballer. <laughs> One of the two of them, maybe I'd be happy enough with that. Really? Yeah. And what, <laughs> what would you have been like on the golf course? Are you handy enough? Or um, okay, I I try <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I try. Um, I enjoy it now. The golf, I enjoy it as a. It's a nice getaway from. It's something competitive that's not that's away from rugby. I suppose it's a good chance to switch off. But I don't know. I, I don't think there's any. There wouldn't be much hope for me. But I could dream. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Yeah, I can. I'm just. I'm actually laughing to myself now, just thinking because obviously you guys are pretty big. Like you're fairly well built, and then I'm just imagining you on the golf course, just on the green with a putter, just trying to kind of coast the ball in. Oh, for pretty some most of the time I can promise you that. <laughs> for some reason, I think uh, I think you're more suited to the rugby pitch for now, yeah. Josh. Yeah. <laughs> no offense taken. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, we've heard about your soon-to-be career, or maybe we put that on hold on the golf course. But when you're on the rugby pitch, what Adidas boots do you currently wear? And why do you enjoy wearing them? What do they kind of give to your game? I'm currently wearing the a black pair of Predator Malice boots. Um, the new ones, they're, yeah, they're brilliant. I've always liked a, a dark pair of boots. Um, sometimes I dream I could wear, I could wear bright ones and run really quick, like, like some of the superstars over the years. But no, I've always liked a dark pair of boots. And yeah, I find, I find the, the new Malice boots very, very comfortable. Um, the material, the material is lovely, and they're really light as well. I think that's something that normally you have a really comfortable pair that's can be heavy, or an uncomfortable pair that's really light. But these are have a bit of both, which is great. So yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy them. Deadly, and I think like like you said, so many. There's a lot of people who probably prefer a darker style boot, um, especially I suppose on a rugby pitch where, like you say, maybe sometimes the brighter boots can be kept for a little bit more maybe flair players, or you know yeah. maybe the kind of quicker <laughs> players. So. I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that resonates, isn't it? It's always like a darker boot seems to, to always go down well. And I think uh, before the interview, we were obviously looking at the boots. And I think like one of the main features is that they're now made using prime green. So obviously it keeps the boot really lightweight, but at the same time, it's still a nice message there around sustainability where they can, you know, they can use kind of different materials instead of your traditional ones to, to keep the boot nice and lightweight. So I think it's, it's a perfect mix really for Adidas boots, isn't it? It's where... The boot looks good, but then, you know, it's also doing the right things behind the scenes as well. So definitely, uh, definitely looking forward to seeing you on pitch in those Predator Malices for sure. If there was any boots then, Josh, if we want to like, I don't know, travel back a couple of years, like what was the the ultimate Adidas boot? Like what was your favourite boots growing up? Was there any that t- like come off the top of your head that you can think of? Um, I always liked the Predator boots. Um, I had, I had a pair, a red, black and blue pair from... Gosh, maybe, maybe seven, six, seven years ago or so, and uh, I used to love them. So got them. Then they kind of went out. They, you know, the way the the new phase of boots came in. Um, so I, I found a pair on on some sports website, random sports website. Found a pair. Found two pairs. So ordered two pairs of them, and then wore them into the ground. Ripped, ripped, and I actually wore them. My first, uh, my first Irish cap. I was actually wearing them, um, and then they broke. They broke shortly after. Um, but I suppose I got really used to those boots and things. That was kind of my breakthrough, my breakthrough season as well, I guess. So 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say they were they're probably my probably my favorites. It's amazing, isn't it, how you can become so attached to to a style of boot. Like like you said there, you kind of always lean towards Predator and then you know when they do become like you know your big moments like a first cap or you know a first international cap it's it's funny how those kind of moments can stick with you and then you continue to wear that boot isn't it because if you ask anyone they probably do have an affinity to a predator or you know a different style of boot so you think is that something then Josh that you carry on to the pitch would you be like superstitious in any way would there be a thing of I've worn these boots at a big moment in my career I'll continue to wear them like you say until they're basically falling apart or is that anything that comes onto your game at all? Uh, no, I'd, I'd actually make an effort not to be too superstitious. Okay, um, yeah. But obviously there's there's definitely times where you're like, these are boots, they're ripped, but they're the boots, they're so, they're comfortable yeah. and I've, I, they're tried and tested, they've never let me down. So there's definitely a bit of that, um, which is kind of funny when you think about it because you've got a replica and new pair that are the same, but um, ha- haven't, haven't been uh, worn out and tired, but uh, yeah, I suppose that's that's always a a part of it. Is you have a pair of boots that that you love and you're comfortable with. Um, remember, there's one guy I used to play with, uh, Isaac Boss, used to wear a pair of boots. Um, they're about 15 years old, and he used to get them on eBay, and he'd buy as many as he could every time they came up. So I suppose you get people like that as well. You just find find things you're comfortable with, but. Um, yeah, it's definitely important to uh, to feel to feel good with what you're wearing. Um, uh, I always liked. I mean, when I can remember getting a in second year, got a lovely pair of Adidas. Second year in school, got a lovely uh, pair of Adidas flanker boots, and I just felt a million dollars in them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's 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 the great thing about about boots, and I suppose it's the it's the same it's the same thing you kind of mentioned where. Um, you see Lionel Messi um, shooting a top corner from 30 yards out with with his predators on, and then all of a sudden you're like, I need them, and then I'll be able to do it. It's that kind yeah, of yeah, that's it. It's a it's a confidence thing as well. It, sometimes, yeah, it is. Like, but, like you said, you know what works, you know what you're comfortable in. Why change it now? Basically. <laughs> so, Josh, we've heard everything now from the age you started playing rugby to what it was like receiving your first Leinster cap and first international cap. You've told us what you would be if you weren't a rugby player and you've also described to us what boots you're currently wearing. Is there anything that's in your kit bag that you always have? Is there something that you won't travel to games without? What is that one thing that's always in your kit bag? I guess uh, my scrum cap, I guess, is an obvious one. Um, scrum cap and boots, I can't forget them, and the gum shield. But uh, have, yeah. <laughs> other than that, I, I actually I have a list I go through before before I travel away or go into any games and I'll literally have, I'm a bit pedantic about it. I'll have everything. I'll have spare studs, spare boots, spare studs for the spare boots. Uh, it actually, one of the last game we played, um, someone's, one of the lads boots broke at half time or just before half time. And he didn't have a spare pair, but I had a spare. I had a spare yeah. pair. So, so I was, I've saved a couple of people over my, over my time so far, but, uh, yeah, I suppose scrum cap, scrum cap, boots and gum shield is definitely the um, the main ones. But I suppose scrum cap, I haven't forgotten it yet. So I'd say that one's most consistent. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny that you say you've got a, a bit of a list to go through because obviously, like you said, there is going to be players on the team who maybe don't have the same uh, the same turnus as yourself. So it's funny to hear that you've saved a couple of people at halftime over the years. <laughs> definitely it's definitely worth having a list i think to go through on your kit bag on a match day isn't it absolutely <laughs> so josh obviously coming out of the back of covid and with fans not being able to attend games you guys played on friday at the rds where you did have fans at the game what was that like how good was it to have fans back in the stadium yeah it was incredible um it was a long time uh, it was a long time without them um it actually felt it's got to the stage where if you ask me what it's like People would always ask what it's like with no fans, but now yeah. it's kind of got to the stage where it was like it felt normal with no fans, and then having the fans there was was absolutely incredible. Um, I suppose the the difference they make uh, when things were going our way, when we someone makes a big tackle, someone made a line break, or did something well, and you hear that that roar of the crowd, it gives you some uh, kind of forget about that that adrenaline rush and how much it, it really does help you and. 
even talking before the game and the, and the motivation it gives uh, us as players to know that the fans are there and they've they've made the effort, they've paid the money to come and watch us play, which is just something uh, I suppose we can't. It's easy to to get used to to take for granted, but it's definitely something that we we really appreciate, and I, and I definitely appreciate it along with all the other lads. We really appreciated it more so than ever. Having having missed the fans for for so so long, it was it was really great to have them back.